Well, welcome. We have here another Milfordian, another person from Milford, who not only has said things could be better, but has said, I'm willing to try and help and make them better. Um, I'll start, as I always do, by saying I'll never ask you to vote for any specific candidate. Not my job. But I will beg you to get to know the candidates and get out and vote. I mean, we've had recent years of 12% participation. We owe ourselves more than that. Because you can't complain that the wrong people are at the helm if you didn't get up and help us pick the right ones. So there's plenty of Kevin Rudden show, this show, um, Senior Center will have debates. Um, I love the fact that the high school has the candidates there so the kids, uh, young adults, <laughs> get involved. But please, get to know who you believe will shepherd our children the best and get out and express your opinion by voting. So let's start with an introduction. Good evening, Al. Al, um, my name is Ferry Steinman. Uh, I am a Milfordian, uh, not in the sense that I think of some of my uh, fellow uh, folks that's running for the school committee. Uh, I was not born here, as you can see from my accent. I was born in Africa, so uh, I made a transition 20 years ago to come to the U.S. Uh, for an assignment. That assignment ended up in uh, staying longer, and we realized that this is a real country with opportunities. And so if you, if you can dream it, you can live it, and that's uh, the big American dream. And we have moved to Milford 10 years ago, so I'm here for a decade. And uh, I have two boys in the school system. Both of them actually are on the uh, uh, special needs uh, group. One is in the Woodland School, uh, that is Marku. He is eight years old, he's going to turn nine. And then I have my oldest in Stacy Middle School in seventh grade, and his name is Ivan, and he's 12, going on 30. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have my beautiful wife. Uh, she is Marie Steinman, and she is very uh, active in the community, uh, does a lot of stuff with the schools as well. And so um, we moved here, as I said, and uh, we love Milford, and we actually love Boston and Massachusetts. Uh, when it comes to wintertime, it's kind of a question then. <laughs> then my wife says, well, why are we living here again? But then comes spring and summer and fall. And Yeah, that's when your old stomping grounds of Orange County yes. in California. Yeah. <laughs> I commuted out there for two and a half years. I knew I didn't blend in, because come November, <laughs> when the temperatures have dropped all the way to 60, they'd give me a convertible for free, and I'm <laughs> driving in my shirt sleeves. <laughs> And guess what? Everybody's in parkas. Yes. That was also amazing because they would say it's freezing. And they actually had fireplaces. I, I, I kind of looked at my wife and said, when we lived out there in uh, California and, and Orange County, I was like, why do they have fireplaces here? Because there's no need for it, I mean, uh, apart from the ambiance. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, I, I am super excited to be here. And um, as some background around myself, even though I was born, um, in a different country. I think everybody in this country have the same story. It's just the time when you got your passport. We all are immigrants, and what makes this country so great is the fact that we can come from different diverse backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, and we can become here, keep that identity. I know we've got a great uh, Portuguese community, which my grandmother, by the way, was also Portuguese. Yeah, there and you go. So I love the food. As you can see, I'm built for comfort, not speed. <laughs> um, and, and just to be able to come here and, and live that, that dream of building a future for yourself. And, and I'm a clear example of that where um, with my wife and the family that uh, we, can came, we could come to the U.S. and live that dream out. Um, I have a passion uh, for, for children because I started my career. I don't want to go too bad because then it will date me. I'm, not, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I started out as a, as a teacher. I was a professional teacher. I taught high, sp high school kids um, and then realized that I could also teach doctors. And I went into the pharmaceutical industry in the early 1990s. And that's where I've been able to continue because it's a continuous training and education, telling them about what is the great things that we do from our company perspective, but also for helping people. So that passion to help people, that's why I stayed in that industry. And then um, 
just the fact that we talk about the children is our future. That's a nice mantra. Everybody says that. I grew up in a, in a small town in South Africa where it took a village to raise you. And when I look at the successes in life that you had, the privileges that you have had, there was because there was always somebody, there's always a teacher that you can go back in your history, in your life, that you can turn back and say, that teacher, he or she, made an impact on your life. And I'm from the belief that too many times you have people sitting on the sidelines and pointing where all the mistakes are um, when you should be on the field. And I played professional, semi-professional rugby in my younger days. And so I always said that uh, all the best players are always sitting on the, on, the, on the stands telling you how they would have played. But those who really are on the field and living it and breathing it is the ones. Yeah, the only thing is I don't want to be on the field in rugby. <laughs> <laughs> you know, of all the sports, I'll take soccer, I, you know, but even hockey, I grew up playing hockey. Mm -hmm. Rugby had no pads. <laughs> yes, just because I didn't say I was smart. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I uh, learned with, with sports. I mean, I think there's a lot of things to be said, and we, we focus on academics. That's important. That's critical. That's why we're going to set up. But we do have a mission in life for our children, at least how I grew up and how I, and that's my philosophy, is that we are raising people that's going to be the next generation, but they have to be citizens that can add to con and, and contribute to the society. And the problem we have is we are tend to sometimes get so myopic in our view that we think about just the academics. We're thinking about just certain programs, and we forget about, at the end of the day, we are sending young adults into the work environment, into real life, and they got to be ready and prepared for it. And we need to prepare them for that life, not for just getting the, the metrics taken care of. That is important. But the, me, for me, the biggest thing is, how do we prepare them for life? Now, coming to the U.S., yes. you've explained. What brought you to Milford? Work. So I, um, as I said, I worked in the pharma biotech industry. I came to Boston in 2009 to come and work at that stage, which was considered a very small biotech company, which was called Biogen. <laughs> um, and I had a great career there. From there on, I've moved to other ultra-rare diseases. Again, the passion I have. But it was work um, that brought me here. And um, funny enough, I've lived all over the world. I've lived in the Midwest. I've lived in the West Coast and I've lived in the East Coast, but this is the town where I've lived the longest my whole life. So um, and my wife and I were sitting, I think it was last year around the December, we were talking and we said, you know what, we've, we've moved all over around the world, but this is actually the one place that we can call home. Um, and I always say home is where the heart is, but this is home because this is the longest that we've lived in one now place. Now your oldest is in Stacy? He's in Stacy, yes. Seventh grade or eighth? Seventh grade. So two more years before we see him in the high school. Yes, and uh, I think that is fantastic because I have had the privilege to engage with Josh Otlin uh, because he coached Ivan for soccer uh, when he was still in elementary school. Oh, wow. So a um, uh, fantastic person in terms of coaching, the passion you could see that he has for the children. And I also saw some of the amazing work that he has done. I know a lot of people tend to talk about some other schools in the ne nearing towns that has these amazing programs. But I was able to sit in one of his presentations, and he showed how we've taken what we have, not the cream of the cream of the crop. And we've basically taken that and uh, got them ready for career, for the next thing. Well, I think with Josh, you hit it on the head. Everything I've been involved with, because he was coaching a soccer team next to my daughter, coaching a soccer team. There was a passion there for teaching the kids. Yes. I go to the high school in different mentoring programs. I've been, I see him with a passion. Yes. And no matter what you start with, mm. if you have that passion, you're going to win. And yeah. the kids are going to win because of you. Yes. I, I cannot agree with you more. Um, because I always say to my boys, there's a question you always have to ask. What's the why? Why am I doing this? Why am I here? What is it that I need to achieve? But that, if you understand the why, the purpose that you have, uh, I'll give you an example. I was 
and I don't know, maybe it was because of a lack of, that they didn't have enough people, but I was asked by Babson College to come and talk to their MBA graduates a while ago. And I thought to myself, I think there's a lot more smarter people and a much more accomplished <laughs> people than myself. And I thought to myself, what do you say to a bunch of graduates? Because Babson School is known as one of those entrepreneurial schools. So what do you say to them? I mean, some of them most probably already have patents. And some are actually, there were some of those who, um, who were graduating that already had patents and, 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 and business models and actually started some, some really creative things. Mm. And I thought to myself, if I were to go back in time and I look at myself as young 30 and says, okay, what is the things that I would teach myself or, or um, tell myself that I would do? Um, I realized that as you come out of college, yes, you have book knowledge, you have all of that, but there's this practical application. How do you solve for problems? And how do you, how do you just take life on, on, on a daily basis? I realized that in the beginning, you will learn basically the job that you're going to do. Even though you've studied for it, you will learn it. It's very seldom unless you're a dentist or a doctor. But then as you car your career progresses, the one thing that I've learned is, is that you depend more on people. And that then brings you back to your interactions with other people. What is that human interaction? What is the, as they say, the soft skills, the people in body language, but also that EQ, the emotional intelligence. And I would say there was two things that I would put a significant amount of em emphasis on that I now realize in life. And the first thing is make sure that you can command the English language. Take a grammar course because you're going to be writing to people, you're going to be talking to people, so you better make sure. So if my grammar is often, I, it's because I didn't pay attention to uh, when I was younger. Uh, but also the second thing was as invest in, 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 in learning to uh, communicate with people. Uh, those soft skills, those, those emotional intelligence. Because as you get higher, you have to do things through people. And that's the thing that I look at our schools, is that we, we, we look at our kids and we have so much big dreams for them as parents. But as they go through life, how do we prepare them to think about, you're gonna have to work with people. So that social interaction is important. And I know we have got some great programs here at Mulford and in, 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 in this country. And in fact, Massachusetts as a state, when it comes to education, it's, it's, it's up there, and so we sometimes complain about, the, with a, as we say back in South Africa, with a white loaf of bread under your arm, when you think about it, that we actually are one of the states with the highest uh, level of education over, on average. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we can relax, but it means we do have a lot of good things going here that we sometimes forget. I love it. Mm. Okay, we're gonna start. Mm. Be, it's a lot of fun just to talk, but oh, well, yeah, we've got to get to work. <laughs> Let's get to work. Ferdy, I'm from Milford. Yes. Why should I vote for you? Thank you for asking that question. You should not vote for me because you don't know me yet. And I hope that after this uh, time that we have together, if you ask me that question again, you'll have a better sense. Because I think you need to know who you are asking to represent you. Um, so I can give you all of the answers that I'm passionate about children. I was a teacher, I played professional sports, I come from Africa, so that gives me that diversity background as well. All of those things, but at the end of the day, we are here and I run for the school committee because I have a passion for training the next generation. I was a teacher, I still do that, and we never stop learning, we never stop growing. And at the end of the day, hopefully I've given you and the audience enough information so that you can see whether I am the candidate. And at the end of the day, whether I make it or not, my commitment and involvement will stay the same. I'm involved with the schools now. And I would just like to have the right candidate that will have the children and their future in mind versus own personal agendas. Because we cannot afford to have that. We are here because of the children. What do you think of the three biggest challenges you're going to run into on the school committee? Well. Well, first and foremost, it would be presumptuous of me to say that I know all of those biggest problems. I think as you look at um, this role, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to learn in terms of just the, the policies, the, the budgeting and things. And, I, and I've, I've got some information that I've done my homework and I get an idea, but I think once you get there and you really understand it, I think then you can really talk about it. But I, what I could sense from what I've read from some reports and talking to the teachers as well as to some of the parents, we have a growing school community. I mean, every year on average we have about 100 kids. I think this last year it was, or the, yeah, we had like 150. 
So we kind of uh, uh, we have to deal with our own successes because of our programs that we do that kids want to come here. Now, that's a good thing, but I think you sitting on the financial uh, committee and knowing that, that, that obviously we have only a limited amount of money and how do we apply that. But I think that's the main driver for, I think, what we would consider is challenges. I think if you look at the teachers, if you look at workload, um, when I speak to them and I say, okay, how do we help you as parents? But they will say to you, there's so much more I want to do, but there's so much, so much hours and there's so, much kids in the, so many kids in the class. And they can burn out and some of them, we want to get those uh, teachers that are passionate, that has that um, vision, but at the same time, we also don't want to tap them to the point where they get and say, you know what, that's enough, I'm going to go to a, a different school district. So I think part of that problem, or not a problem, it's a good thing to have is just to have kids here, is the fact that because of the amount of kids coming in, there could be that uh, work overload. I think also with that, um, Milford has a very high proportion of children that have special needs. I know it because I've got two of them. Uh, that's over, what, 52% of, of the children that we have that comes that's in our system has that. So that even takes a bigger burden, again, on the system because those are resources that's needed. And that in itself um, can be taxing on the people because we deal with people, not machines. Um, and, I, and I just think if you look at the class size, again, it comes back to we all would like to have one-on-one -on -one tutor, and we all would like to have that kind of thing, but we can't. And so how do we make that? It's, I think that's, that's kind of the root cause, but I would be presumptuous to say I know all of the challenges. I think I would want to get, um, as I get more into this, I think we will be able to really address. Now, you came to Milford. Yes. As a short-term immigrant. Yes. My family is a little longer-term immigrant. My family came to Milford in 39 and then my mom in 41. Awesome. But what you said was profound. We're all immigrants. Unless you have a Native American name, yeah. one way or another you came to here. Yes. Um, as you think about mm -hmm. the impact that the immigrants have had in our town, what's your reaction? I think we have like you said, we have a diverse population. And the impact that we have, because there's, there's certain things that we are more apt to do. There is, within the town, businesses like, if you think about Waters, I'm thinking about uh, EMC, uh, where we actually have the ability to give that. But then there's, there's a lot of folks here that do the, the, what I would call the tradesman tasks from carpentry to electricians to that. And I think that there is there's always going to be that need. Um, I grew up with my dad. He had a high school the pl degree or graduated from high school and he had his own business. And he always said to me that yes, you can go to college and you can have multiple degrees. But at the end of the day, people will need services and they will need people that are willing and capable of doing that. And I think with the population that we have, we tend to look at it and say, well, yes, this disproportionate, there's not as much academic, not as much professional people. I think the, the, the community can carry that and we need to be able to see how we can further develop because there's a lot of development. I look around and I think I've heard, uh, it was one of the interviews you did, so I'm actually one of your seven, not six. <laughs> um, but it talked about how we are, there's so much room to um, expand in Milford and really grow Milford. And I know there's this concern about, become, is it becoming more like a city uh, versus that, but it all brings value to the, to, to, to the, to the community, uh, housing prices, all of that. And so yes, there are that diversity with people coming here. And if you're willing to work, in this country, there is always an opportunity. There's always work to be done. I mean, that's the one thing I, I can say unequivocally, that if you are willing to roll up your sleeves, there will be work and there's always opportunity. As we look at how we educate the kids. Yes. You know, there's different groupings, mm. you know, and some of the groups are growing faster than others. I mean, you mentioned this year we have 170 kids joining the Milford school system. Last year there was 150. I mean, that's amazing to me because 
we were just talking with the superintendent because he brought up the fact that some of us remind him that he only got one student a year for many years. Yeah. That high school in 74, the first class out of there, had 222 children. <laughs> I know because I was one of them. <laughs> Three years ago, we graduated 260. So we added 40 kids over 40 years. Now all of a sudden, the, the, the paradigm is shifting. Because when you're adding 150 a year, oh, yeah. it brings all new challenges. Oh, yes. So as we look, I mean, I look at all 4,500 kids with special needs. Oh. They all have, you know, the, what we label as special needs kids, I've said, I think they're no more special, but no less special than all the other kids that we have to take care of. So if we look at the groupings, how do you think we do for the top 10, 15% to educate them, to help them become the next Nobel laureates? I'm glad you made the comment because it's funny enough, I actually just had this conversation a week ago with um, the IEP committee for my older son. When I asked him and I said, when you look at how do we, how do we, how do we address we teach for the special needs, but everybody in the school can benefit from executive functioning, as an example, which is a special needs program. And because of that, why don't we just teach it to all of our children? Because that will raise the bar for everybody. I said, so that's one of those things, and that could relieve some of those resources. But to answer your question, what do we do with that? And I look at it as a bell distribution curve. You have that top, and if you look at it, yes, we have people that, um, school of choice out of Milford. And it's unfortunate because they feel or believe maybe that there's not opportunities here for their children. And they are just as important as what we have the children with the special needs. But I think there's a group that we completely sometimes forget about, and that's the group in the middle. They don't fall into this high performing versus the people with this uh, special needs. And I think we should be thinking about all of those children. And I want to go through each group. Yes. Um, so Ta you've got a kid who's top academic. How do you think Milford does with them? How do they do with them? I think we do provide programs for them, but we don't necessarily have, and again, this is my opinion, uh, and that's why I said I would need to learn more, but I think we, we have expectations, and more so sometimes from, from parents, that we want more for them. How do we do? I think we do offer programs, and they are good, the ones that I know of. Um, but I think we can always do better. I mean, for children, there is no, if, uh, we, uh, as I say, you have to have a learning mind. You have to have an open mind. And when you have people top performing, you need to stimulate them. And whatever that means, within reason, within budget, we need to be able to push that and give them a, uh, that ability. We don't want them to go school of choice out because they think there's other programs. But I also want to say this. We as parents, and, and again, I put myself here first and foremost, we tend to sometimes abdicate our roles and we try to push it onto the school system to take care of those children. And I know, and, I, and I know I'm not saying that there are parents that are doing that primarily, but we tend to think the school system has to f um, f um, provide for that. But I think what we need to think as, as a community, how do I as a parent, how do we as a community, and not just the school system, come alongside and provide that? Uh, we need to start thinking creatively about programs where we can take these kids that have that. Do we have an ability to bring them into programs where they can um, go to, we have uh, the, the biotechs we have um, uh, like waters. Take them on as a, 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 with a parental prog program. We did something like that in Boston where we can bring them at a young age and say, okay, let's see this. Let's, let's take you in, and see where you can apply if you're in math, strong in math or in, in science. Oh, and, and Couldn't agree with you more. My career started because somebody gave me an internship in the food ag applications lab at Waters. Yeah. You know, I was a junior in college and an ex-Holy Cross alum took me in, taught me, and that's what started me. Yeah. You know, um, I'm proud of what Milford offers our top kids. Yes. We could do better. We always can. We always can. But you know, the fact that they have the virtual classroom, that they're participating with kids all over the country, 
Oh, it's wonderful. I mean, I've mentioned a couple times, my senior year, there were three of us that got sent out of Milford because we ran out of science courses. <laughs> so they sent us over to Dean Junior College, which was wonderful Yeah, because we got to take college chemistry, college biology. But I'm even happier that we don't have to do that today. Hmm. Now, we have a group in the middle. Yes. Um, they're right at the median. Yeah. They're not your top 10%. They're not your bottom academically. They're right in the middle. How do you think we do for them? Again, this is my opinion. So um, mm -hmm. I think that that's the group that I think we can do better, a lot better. Because how do we get people to have the drive to do better is we have to put them in positions and in opportunities where they are stretched. Because if they are average and we are not giving them that nudge to try and, and, and put them in situations where they can grow, that's where they're going to stay. Now, we, we need solid people, and that's good. Uh, but I think we can definitely learn. And if you think about where the technology is going, as an example, like you said, we are going to be in a future where we will have to learn certain things like computer languages. It's going to become a, a language, coding, and things. We need to start thinking about creative ways. Like you said, digital, we have that right in our back doors, um, where we have a lot of our local folks. And we've got some very strong um, software organizations in the, in, the, in the vicinity where we can come in and help these folks to challenge them. And also, again, they're, 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 that's the area I think I would love to see more. Because I spoke to some of uh, friends and, and colleagues and neighbors, and they feel like, yes, they, they're good. They're not going to rock the boat. But yes, they, they do need that stimulation. And every parent wants to see that. I mean, I want to see my children excel. And you sure. Want to, yeah. My concern, mm -hmm. and it's personal, because my father was one of the most educated, uneducated people. Yes. He came from Portugal. He had his four years of school, because mm. that's what you got in the villages back there. Yes. Um, if you put him in organic chemistry class, he would not do well. But the man was an artist if you gave him a tool. Yes. As a craftsman, I've never seen somebody who, I was just in awe to see what he could do. He had a forge that he built his own tools. <laughs> when he couldn't get the one he wanted, um, there was a time at Waters where they were trying to save a chip and they finally figured out that the Portuguese ladies were about 60% less waste than the other lines. And when they finally figured out what had happened, my mother had brought home the board with the chip. My father had made an extraction tool by hand. And they were able to extract the chips, reseed them without losing them. But now I think somebody like my dad couldn't get into Blackstone Valley, mm -hmm. our vocational school because he wouldn't be in the top 10% academically. Mm -hmm. So where does he go? What do we do for kids like that? They're not dumb. No. They're smart. A lot of them are hardworking, driven, but they can't get into a vocational school. Now what do we do? Yeah, and that is where I'm really very excited when I saw what Josh was doing with the high school kids, with the programs. I think to your point, the future is not just, every, not everybody can be professors, doctors, and have these uh, educated positions or professional jobs. I think having that ability to put programs in place where you have practical, hands-on experience. And as I said, if you think about it, we all need services. Um, it reminds me of a story that uh, I'm not sure whether this is a uh, urban le legend, or, but it was in South Africa where this was a, he, w he was a well-known, apparently a well-known cardio, um, cardiothoracic surgeon. And uh, he had a very big event, had all the people there, and he had some issues with plumbing in the bathroom. So he called the plumber. Plumber came out, fixed it, and when he gave him the bill, it was three times the amount that he would charge 
for a surgery. <laughs> and the guy looked at him and said to him, well, help me understand, I'm one of the world's leading cardiothoracic surgeons. I don't charge patients that. How can you charge me that? He said, what do you think I did before I became a plumber? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but the point there was, we need people like this. We need electricians. We need mechanics. We need these folks that have hands on. And in fact, that's, if you can work with your hands, you will always have a job. In fact, that is job security bar none, because we know how this industry goes. People like uh, myself, I've gone through that re re recession where we size up, we size down. Then there's fr uh, product failures that don't come to market. Well, then we have to kind of get, play musical chairs. When you have that ability and, um, and able to do that, I think that's where you really give people hope and confidence that they have, will always be able to provide. And that's when I look at my dad. He didn't have it either. I mean, he was, he, he trained himself to become a printer. That was now, nowadays the, the kids wouldn't know what that means. Wouldn't they? they would all think it's digital. But he was, and I would, I would work with him in my vacations. You got to clean that machine with the plates. You had to burn the plate. All those things, that is a trade skill that he had learned because when he came and he was still in school, he had a, a, a gentleman on the street that had a printing company and he came to work for him because he wanted money so he couldn't um, uh, entertain my mom. It's funny you say that because until my dad passed away, his biggest concern yes. was that I didn't have a trade. He said, someday they're going to find out you have a title, vice president, and all you do is fly around the world and drink coffee. <laughs> what happens when they find out that you don't do anything except drink coffee and talk to people? He says, I'm going to have to support you when you have to come home with your family. And it was just a riot because, God bless him, he just couldn't understand how people pay you to fly around the country <laughs> it, and just talk. It sounds like my mom, because my mom said to me when I became a sales rep, she said to me, let me get this straight. So they gave you a company car and you wear a fancy suit and then you go and you talk to doctors and they pay you to do that. I said, exactly. Yes. I said, but mom, I'm training, I'm educating. She said, no, you're just talking to people and they pay you to do that. That's amazing. So yes, you're right. But if you have that skill, and I think there's a lot of wisdom, there's a lot of that tradesman skills that get lost because we can go to some of the schools and they, and they help them. But I think sometimes if you can just have that mentor, I mean, we all need that person in life just from a personal coach, but also just from a, from a vocation that really shows you the finer things that you don't find in textbooks, how to uh, repair. Well, you mentioned it, how to deal with people, how to work with people, yeah. how to respect other people's skills. Yes. You know, I mean, I remember when my daughter had a paper due mm -hmm. and she, she was looking for my darling bride to edit it. Yeah. And I looked, I said, honey, you want me to edit it for you? And she just looked and says, dad, with all due respect, you have the grammar skills of a dead bovine. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay, I guess you don't want me to edit the grammar. Yeah, well, that's true. Now, you coming to this country, you had a big advantage that the language was not an issue. Yeah. How, how do you think we're dealing with the kids, the families who come here, and the language is an issue? Yes, I mean, I think you heard when I said, if I went back in time, what would I do? I would make sure I have a proper English grammar language. Language is what we communicate. And yes, we are in America, we keep our cultural uh, backgrounds, but we have to communicate. And if you're here, you have to communicate in the language of English. Um, I know that the schools have put a great, uh, with um, Kevin and the team, has put a great math program and it seems like they were starting to get some momentum. Um, I've heard some rumors that we are starting to look at ELA. And yes, we need to, because if you can't communicate, then everything falls flat. And I think to that point, if you come here in this, in this country, we, we would do ourselves a disfavor versus just the children, not by, excuse me, by not teaching them the art of communication and, and having that language, because that's how we communicate. That we, without that, we are just... Well, you know, again, if you can't communicate properly, when you go for that interview, you're not going to get that. You may be academically brilliant, but if you can't bring that across, yes, you're at a disadvantage to get that first job. Oh, for sure. In fact, if you think about it, technology is actually not helping us because nowadays kids think with their fingers. They, yes. 
uh, and that social interaction goes away. And I'm not, I'm not just saying the young adults and the young children, all of us, it's so much easier to send a quick email and st instead of having to deal with the reality of facing people. We don't have that, that skill of how do you have a difficult conversation? Well, I mean, today I got an email in this morning and I'm looking at it and it's in Mandarin. Okay, Google Translator. <laughs> you know, and I sit there and I say, you know, when I went to Europe, I had to learn French because I was living in France. Mm -hmm. I started learning Russian because I was going to the Soviet Union twice a month. Yeah. I actually started learning Arabic just because oh. I'm in Saudi, I'm in Kuwait, I'm in Qatar. Well, Qatar. Now I used to be Qatar. Yeah. Um, and it was just something that if I want to get in a taxi, you know, and today it's so much easier that I think we take for granted. And the only place I found worse than the U.S. for language skills was the Soviet Union. Yeah. You know, but when you think about it, if I go to Europe, the kids, two, three languages without even blinking. Yes. And that's why it's so important to invest in the children at this young age. Because when you learn a language, and I know because I taught African languages, which, by the way, when I came here, didn't help me any at all. At all. So, but when they're that young, um, that's a part of the brain that gets stimulated. Now I'm going to get a little bit on, on the science side, which is those uh, neural pathways that needs to be developed. And when you teach um, children that language and invest in it, it does not have just the benefit of communication but the, the pathways that gets connected in the brain helps them further develop. And that's why it's important. I, I think I would say we put emphasis on science and math. That's important because the teachers should problem solving and critical thinking. But language, you need that. And when they're young, that's when we should put the investment there. Well, you think about it. How many major international conferences do, do you go to that you don't see people from many countries and many, speaking many languages. There's not one, there's not one. None, I mean, you know, you start talking, you know, that other little biotech company that um, specialized in liposomal storage disorders. Yeah. Okay, now Sanofi, but Genzyme, when they held conferences, you had people from all over the world. Yeah. And it was a lot easier to talk to them in their language. Oh, by far. You know, to, the, to this day, when I'm dealing with pharmaceutical companies in Brazil, it's just easier to flip to Portuguese. Oh, there's, there's, a, there's a trust relationship because we, we, we are human beings. We, we, as I always say to uh, the sales folks, people buy from people they know and trust. Yeah. And when you speak their language, I mean, I always try to learn a language as well. The first thing I always learn is how to order food. <laughs> That's important. And how do I get from point A to point B? But when you do that, you have a different connection. And again, we think about our school systems sometimes very as parents, very much on metrics, because that's what we can measure. But we don't think about how do I prepare the children for a life out here? And that's where we get this. This is a great opportunity. I mean, I, I, one of the school teachers that my son is with, uh, with Spanish, they can only speak Spanish in the classroom. They immerse them. No, the immersion program. And you know what? It is amazing because now, funny enough, my son is not the only one that's learning that Spanish, but so is my wife and I. Now. Right. Because he comes home and he starts talking. I'm like, hey, uh, uh, I would say, por favor, cerveza. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You but, learned an important one. Exactly. And that's, 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 the, that's the benefit of making sure that when they go out there, they can communicate. Now, you have a unique perspective on the next group. We're criticized many times for putting too much money into our special needs programs. And I mean, people have come out and point blank yelled at me about how much money we support. Before I say anything else, mm. what do you think about our special needs programs? I would say we could always do better. Because how do you, how do you justify, how do you look yourself in the mirror and say, okay, there's kids with needs but I'm not going to spend it because there's too much money. Um, and I know this, the, the wallet is only so big and, um, that we have to deal with. Now we can try to find tax more. That's not going to sit well with people. We can try to look for programs how we can do it better. I do think that we need to challenge ourselves. How can we become more creative? 
And that's that's things that I love. That's how the, that critical thinking, how to solve problems, was installed by teachers in a young age. Is how do you solve for that? And I think if we think about the special needs program, we are spending a lot of money there because there's a need. But we can become smarter. We can get there. And again, this is me not understanding. I, I have my world with my two boys. But I know there's a lot more programs. But I also think that some of those programs, if we just apply that across our whole classroom, that elevates it. And that will actually help a lot of times the fact that we have to have separate programs there. If it becomes part of that bigger program, we elevate in general and all kids benefit. I think that's the goal. We, we, we spend a significant amount of money in this country on, on the education. But we need to think about it. How can we think about it differently so that we can get more out of it? Not necessarily spend more money, but spend, get more value. I think some of the issues are people feel that we're spending money helping kids that are outside of Milford. Yeah, but you know what? Children need help, whether we like it or not. And I cannot walk, um, as, as I say, as a teacher, when I was teaching in a classroom and I had, um, my, my colleague couldn't be there, I wouldn't say, well, sorry, that's not my classroom, this is my classroom. You bring that kids in your classroom, you say, you know what? That teacher's not available now, let's, let's work here. You, you, you cannot, that, that, that's where we as adults need to sometimes grow up. Well, that's it. where, I mean, we set the budget up very different from all the towns around us mm -hmm. because we saw conflict between the parents of typical kids and the parents of special needs kids, each wanting more. But if you gave more to special needs, you took it away here. And luckily, we got support many years ago to split the budget up to say, okay, special needs is its own budget. Mm -hmm. The typical kids, they have to live by the same rules that all the other departments, you know, 2.5% increase. But if we got a few extra special needs kids, it's not going to take money out of that budget. Mm -hmm. So every year the school committee comes to us and says, okay, I spent $100 last year on special needs. And this year we got two, three kids. I'm spending $110. So we fund that out of the general fund so we don't influence or take away from the typical kids. Mm. What do you think of that system? Well, I don't think there's ever going to be a perfect system. I think that is, that is a creative way of looking at it. Um, I, I, I would think, and again, I'm in a growing mode looking at this, but I, I would say, just off the cuff, that you need to think about it differently because when we look at money, when we make decisions based on money, we are making decisions with the wrong mo uh, motives. When we think about what is the best way to get the kids there, and I'm not just saying we have a blank check, but we gotta start thinking about how do we take what we have and make that work better? Because I think, as you said, we spend a significant amount of money, and, and I'm from, Limited knowledge, but I think I have, my, my, I have a very strong opinion on this, is that if we take some of those programs and apply it across the school, it becomes to those who are just not in the, in the category of the special needs, I think we're really going to see overall improvement. And, and that's where I think we need to think about it, because look at how much one-on-ones uh, uh, -on do we need with, uh, um, with teachers. That's, that's a, the biggest cost apart from your infrastructure is your, is, your, is your salaries. How do we take that and say, you know what, we don't need more teachers necessarily to do that. Maybe we just need to have that ability to take that program and apply it so that that skill set gets there and everybody benefits versus just saying this group gets that, that benefit, this kid gets a different benefit. Let's get them Let's raise the bar overall across. Now, in Milford, yes. we have, at least a few of us have, a special word for, um, or a special definition of profanity. Okay. And it's called two and a half override and debt exclusion. Okay. How do you feel about two and a half overrides? Two and a half overrides. I have no idea what it means. Okay. Now, basically, we can raise our levy, the amount we tax, by 2.5% yes. by just asking town meeting. If we go over 2.5% mm -hmm. in the budget increase, then we have to go back to 
the residents and ask. What's, do you have a feeling on? I think if, if uh, it gets back to my original point. If you know the why, you can do a lot of things. And if people understand why you're doing what you do and what's the purpose, what's the goal, I think then, then people will buy in. I think a lot of times people kick their heel in because they don't have the facts or mm -hmm. they don't know why. They don't understand. So I, I cannot say to you is it right or wrong. I think if you come to me and you give me a compelling reason for why we need to do this, why would I not do it? Now, you mentioned school choice. Yes. Over the years, we've suffered with more people leaving Milford school system than coming in. Any idea what we can do to turn that around? You know what, uh, what I love about this country is, is that you have, and this is my country because I'm American as well, is, is that you have freedom of choice. I mean, nowhere in the world do we have the choices that we have in this sure. country. And so if a parent feels that there's no benefits or that their children can maximize, they have that choice and they have the full right to do that. I believe charity begins at home. I believe that you invest where you live. That's why I became a citizen when my assignment stayed longer because I could not be a log rolling between two continents because you benefit from where you live. This is where you have your, 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 your um, health. This is where you have your, um, so your, your safety. All of the systems that we have is here. So yes, you have choice. And I will never say that you cannot execute that choice. But you want to make sure. So how do we do that? I think we need to think about it again. It comes back to how do we take that bell distribution and say, instead of trying to spread it out, how do we elevate what we are offering so that we offer to those kids? And like I said, there could be those mentor programs. As an example, I'm, I'm sure that if we come together, there's a lot more talented and smart people than me that can come up with some creative ways how we can help those kids so that they don't have to feel that they have to go out there. Now, again, what's the motivation? Is the motivation academics purely? Or is it because we have a diverse background? Well, when we started here, when we came here, my oldest son was at school of choice out of Milford for, for, uh, for two years. And we said, no, this is the place. We live. But what brought you back? Because that passion of I live here, um, why would I go there? Plus, this is the community. This is where he needs to go. Yes, this is where he's going to grow up. And so why would I do another town? Plus, also, we invest in this community. So if you invest in this community, then you should also make sure that you can pull out of that. And that's why I felt the school system in Milford is one of, I mean, again, we, we, we tend to look at Milford and saying, well, there, yeah, there's certain pockets uh, or certain programs that's not necessarily meeting our expectations. But we tend to forget overall, we have really good education, especially in Massachusetts. But again, I don't say that's the standard. Everybody has their expectations. Parents have expectations. So, yeah, um, we came back because, and plus my young son, I, I, we both of them, we said we want to be here, plus the programs that the schools offer, uh, the special education programs, those are people that are passionate about what they do. And you live there. This is your friends. This is your neighbors. This is, your, this is the teachers that your kids hang out with. They go to soccer. There's no rugby yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have to go to a different town to do that, but my sons are not playing rugby yet. But this is where you live. Now, a couple of years ago, we made a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. And for our budget, it was big. We invested over $600,000 mm -hmm. to set up a SWAT team in yes. Milford. Yeah. Any opinion on that? Safety is non-negotiable. How do, you, how, do you, how do you put a price? No. And again, the biggest threat that we have in this country is internal. It's not the threat from outside as much as we think about 9-11. Yes, do the SWAT team, do we need to keep our kids safe? By far. I don't know, but I know I've seen some numbers where they say the response time for a lot of times for the, for the, for the uh, um, police services, the SWAT teams to react and to get to, is sometimes too late because by the time they get there, I don't know what the numbers is here, but that's not the 30, reason. It was 42 minutes was the average reaction time from when in Milford we'd call out for SWAT. Yeah. I remember looking at our chairman, Chris and I were looking at each other, 
when this proposal came up saying, God help us if something happens. The average shooting incident is over in 18 minutes. SWAT can get here within 42. I said, okay, how would you look at a parent and say, I could have done something that maybe saved your child, and because of 600, now 600,000 is a ton of money. Yeah. That's what but would... one, how could I look at you and say, I, maybe I could have saved your son? You know, and realistically, we're running a three and a half million dollar surplus. I mean, we had 14 years straight of surplus because we do squeeze everywhere we can. <laughs> but to not have that SWAT team, to not invest in the security. Oh, I mean, and again, this is, this, this is non-negotiable as I say it, but think about it. There's a reason why we sometimes have these incidences in schools. It comes back to how do we raise that level of EQ how do we raise these children to be ready for life? And there are programs, I know we've got anti-bullying programs, we've got all of that, but at the end of the day, we need to raise these children to be ready to be able to go out there. And again, we, it starts with you, it starts with me, it starts with the children as well, taking accountability, but the parents, everybody in this community has to take hands and say, this is the children, and my dad always said to me, when he got old, he said, I'm taking care of you because I know you're going to choose my old age on one day. So I know if I don't do that. And I said, no, I wouldn't do that. But that's who's going to, who's yeah, going to take care of us when we get to you've that. You've said something profound. I'm taking care of you. One, because I want to. And it, yeah. But two, aren't I teaching you how to take care of me? Yes. Because someday, yeah. I mean, I'm already close to it. <laughs> At 64 this year, I'm coming awful close. Uh, <laughs> but you sit there and say, if, when I was coaching, yeah. I had certain parents that I never saw. You know, it always amazed me because the single parents, the single moms, the single dads that have two, three kids, and they were there at every game, every practice. They were always on the Amazing. pitch. I, I don't know how they did it because we had... My darling bride, my sainted mother, and me, three against two, and we barely kept up. Yeah. How they did one against three, <laughs> you know. Yes. But when I go to the nursing homes, or when I, and you see these people warehoused, waiting to take the long bus ride, yeah. the final ride, I sit there and say, well, who taught their kids that women? You can't do this. If it, I mean, there's parents that, like when my mom had the dementia, we got to a point where it was a safety issue. Mm. We no longer could watch her 24-7. Okay, so, I mean, three, four times a week we went over. You know, we've got the geriatric, well, um, countryside. We can't call it geriatric authority <laughs> anymore. But we got countryside, and we were blessed that they're a mile away. Yes. But again, I see too much of... When we were growing up, we were expect the teachers were expected to educate us. Mm -hmm. Today, I see them also expected to raise us. Yes, that's a scary movie. Yeah, and that's not fair. It's not fair to those teachers because they have family and, and family lives too, and that's why I say if we think about this situation, and when we take that accountability, we've abdicated the role as parents in some cases. Not all of us like you said, but we need to take that accountability to say, it is my job to raise my boy, my goal. And the school comes alongside and they just enhance, they further develop them so that when they are in a social environment, because otherwise I could have homeschooled my children. Right. And, but how do, I teach, how, do I, how do they learn the social interactions? How to deal with the fact that, you know what, not every time you can have your way, there's other people's, they have to take chances and uh, turns. Those are skills that you can only learn in a public school. Uh, and and, and, and I, I'm not saying that I'm against any homeschooling or anything. I think there, there's a place, people have choice, like I said. But when it comes to those skills, those are the skills, because we, we, are, we are a uh, society of, uh, of, of um, interactions. We, we have to interact with people. And so let's teach our children that skill 
because I will tell you now, it will elevate. And when you elevate them and you elevate them and you teach them how to become problem solvers, how to be people that are compassionate and, and care and work in an environment where it's not just about me. I mean, we've heard a lot of these times where they talk about, oh, everybody's a winner and good job. I tell my boys that you do your best because I want a learning mindset. If you say to me you didn't do your best, Shame on you. Yeah, then you're not a winner, even if, even if the score is higher. Exactly. If you come in and you say, I've done my best, and you lost, you know what? Great, you did your best. Now, what have you learned? What can you do better next time? We need to come and have, and, and those are skills that I learned from teachers. I mean, the, 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 my, my, my ability to look at problem solving was because I came from a, a country where we didn't have a lot of the things, but that what we have, we had to make work. But I had teachers saying to me, well, okay, you don't have it. How are you going to solve this? Well, see, you bring it up because my first semester yes. at Holy Cross, wait a minute, I got to study to get an A? <laughs> so I flunked my first calculus test. Oh, woe is me. I go into the professor, and Dr. Salsky looked at me and says, oh, if that's what you're going to do, there's nine people looking to get that chair you're in. Go back to Milford. Learn how to say, do you want fries with that order? <laughs> and he absolutely annoyed me yeah. because he was right. I didn't study hard enough. I didn't work hard enough to earn the grade. Yes. The next time I did, yeah, amazing. Amazing. Ferdy, yes. I'm from Milford. Yes. Why should I vote for you? I am a person of integrity, and for me, the focus is not just, this is not a mantra, it's about the children. I started my career in teaching. I am myself a student of life. I'm continuous learning and I want to be leading by example because I've learned that children will learn best when they see the example that's set. And I'm here not because I want to sit as a spectator on a sideline. I'm here because I want to roll up my sleeves, work with the teachers, work with the community, the parents, and work with the school system so that we can make it a better future. Because when we do that, we all benefit. Thank you. And thank you for being one of the people that steps up and says, not only can it be better, I'm willing to help make it better. Yes, sir. And as always, to our six loyal viewers, please get out and vote. Take a few minutes, learn about the candidates, and then exercise the most important right you have, which is to choose the people who are going to sculpt and set the vision for what your children, what your grandchildren, what your friends' children do eight, ten hours a day. And as always, may God bless. May tomorrow be a better night than tonight. Thank you for joining us. Too long since I've been home